So how do we solve this? One of the tools we could use is Excel. And for your convenience, I have posted on Canvas uh, a handy steam methane reforming calculator, which I'm gonna show you right now. Okay, so here's the calculator. What I'm doing here is pretty much what I just laid out in the notes uh, with a couple of added details, which I'll come to when I get to it. But basically over here on the left side is the main setup block. So I'm taking a basis of one mole of methane. You could look at other amounts, but I just usually just leave it at one because I'm, I'm mostly interested in the composition. I can always multiply by whatever number is in here to get the total flow rate. And then what I'm defining is the steam to carbon ratio. So this is telling me I'm feeding in three waters for every one methane molecule. Because steam methane reforming is pressure dependent, as I sort of was showing you, I also include the pressure. And then uh, this is the temperature. So this is the equilibrium temperature coming out in stream two. The rest of this is the engine. Moving over to E and F. So basically E and F, this is a top-down calculation of the flow rates in the system. Basically what I've done is I've taken Mathematica and I've used it to take those five equations and five unknowns and simplify them as far as I can until I have only one variable remaining, which I iteratively solve on. That one variable is right here. Uh, it's called phi. Phi is basically the, um, it's the amount of, of methane divided by the total amount of possible methane. So it's a number that spans between zero and one. If you specify the amount of methane, you can also solve analytically for the four other species. So as long as I have one variable that I'm adjusting, in this case, the a methane quantity, I can adjust that up and down from zero to the maximum possible amount, and then just adjust it up and down until all of the equations are obeyed. That's basically what I'm doing. So I'm taking the temperature, converting it to Kelvin, and then here's where I calculate NC, NH, and NO. These are the constants in our system, in and out. After those molar flow rates are fixed because they're atom flows. And then based on the temperature and the pressure, uh, here's the enthalpies of all of the species. And that comes down here. So I've got a little thermal block. And for each species in our system, CO, hydrogen, CH4, CO2, and H2O, I have delta H of formation, delta G of formation, delta S of formation, and then I have A, B, C, and D. Those are the coefficients in the heat capacity. So I can integrate the heat capacity to get enthalpy, to get entropy, combine those two together to get Gibbs free energy. And then I take the differences between the Gibbs free energies to get delta G of the reaction. There is a sixth species, which I haven't mentioned. That's solid carbon, which may or may not exist in our system. And in fact, in the material balance, I've ignored it. So I'm not solving the carbon precipitation equilibrium. Rather, I'm calculating all the species as if that carbon equilibrium wasn't happening. And then I'm checking to see if the conditions are such that I would make carbon. And I'll come back to that in a second. So by integrating the heat capacities, we can calculate the enthalpy. So I've calculated the enthalpy of carbon, solid carbon, CO, hydrogen, CH4, CO2, and water. Do the same thing for the entropy, integrate Cp over T. Um, and from that, you can calculate the Gibbs free energies. And then right here, this is this block right here is where we're calculating delta G0 of the steam methane reforming reaction, delta G0 of the water gas shift reaction. And then the third one, this is the coking reaction, as if it were um, happening. That gives me the three Ks. So I'm just taking e to the minus delta G over RT for each of those delta G zeros of reaction. That's going to give me K steam methane reforming, K water gas shift, and K coke. And then I'm going to guess a value of phi. It goes from zero to one. Zero means no methane. One means the maximum amount of methane. I can't have negative amounts of methane. I also can't have methane that exceeds the total possible amount of methane that we could make to keep goal seek from going crazy is instead of using phi directly as the variable that I want to adjust between zero and one, instead I have defined a logarithm of phi over one minus phi. The reason I did that is if you think what happens, if phi goes to zero, 
then phi over one minus phi becomes equal to phi. And the log of phi, as phi goes to zero, goes to minus infinity. And then likewise, if phi goes close to one, then one minus phi becomes close to zero, and this blows up to infinity. So I'm taking the log of infinity, which goes to positive infinity. So the benefit of that is that this quantity, log phi over one minus phi, instead of spanning zero to one, it spans minus infinity to infinity. So now it doesn't matter. You can guess anything, positive or negative, at any magnitude, and it will still calculate a value of phi, which is in the range zero to one. You pose a value of log phi over one minus phi. It calculates phi. So in this case, it looks like 9% of the possible amount of methane. And then it uses analytical relationships from solving the other four equations to calculate the flow rate of CO, flow rate of hydrogen. Flow rate of methane is just directly related to phi. Um, flow rate of CO2, flow rate of water. And then it calculates the total flow rate. And so from each flow rate and the total flow rate, you can calculate the mole fractions. Once you have the mole fractions, you can calculate the product quotient. So Q steam methane reforming, Q water gas shift, and also Q coke. And then it calculates K over Q, and it takes the logarithm of K over Q. So if, water, if the steam methane reforming reaction is at equilibrium, K over Q should equal one, because K should equal Q. And I'm taking the logarithm. Logarithm of one is zero, so the log of k over q should go to zero. And that's what it is, it looks pretty close. So we're basically gonna force this number to be zero by adjusting this guess. And you can do that with goal seek or with solver. So I'm just gonna just demonstrate that. If I set cell F57 to a value of zero by changing our guess and hit okay, it'll adjust that up and down until it gets as close as it can to zero. As a check, I'm checking the water gas shift equilibria. It should be one by definition because I solved the other species using assuming the water gas shift is in equilibrium. So that's just verifying. And then finally, it calculates K over Q for the coking reaction. And what that basically is saying is if I have solid carbon around, K over Q should equal one. And you can see it is not equal to one. It is less than one. What that means is the CO concentration is too low to reach equilibrium with solid carbon. So that's a good thing. It's basically, as long as that number is less than one, there's no coking, or at least we don't have any gas conditions that would thermodynamically predict the creation of coke. So for example, let's say I just put in one water and I do the same thing. So it solved the steam methane reforming equilibrium correctly. Um, so I, I have an equilibrium mixture that obeys S steam methane reforming and also water gas shift, but you see the coking is predicted to happen because now the K over Q is equal to 1.5. That means your CO concentration is too high. So we don't have enough water in this mixture to prevent carbon from precipitating. That brings us over here. And this is the part I didn't talk about. I sort of ran out of time last time. What I'm doing here is I'm looking as a function of temperature. So I'm, I'm letting the temperature vary all the way from room temperature at 300 Kelvin up to whatever, 1200 Kelvin. And I'm recalculating this um, equilibrium for the same gas mixture. So I'm still feeding in a uh, steam to carbon ratio of 2.5 at every point, but I'm then letting it come to equilibrium at these different temperatures. And I wanna see how far the reaction goes proceeds. So I've got 10 different temperatures. These are my guess values for the log of phi over one minus phi. Those are the values I'm going to adjust in order to force the equilibrium to be obeyed at every single temperature. The spreadsheet gives you a couple ways to do that. One is to try to do it with solver. What I've done is a global minimizer. I've basically made an objective function for all of them. I'm adding them together and I'm trying to minimize the sum. I confess that a solver does not really work very well with this problem. Goal seek works fine. You can do this individually. I could say, all right, I'm going to guess this and make that go to zero. I guess this and make that go to zero. But you can also do that by creating a macro. And this is an older version of Excel where, macro, where Visual Basic is still embedded in Excel. It's basically straightforward. I'm, I'm just invoking goal seek repeatedly, forcing it to solve them all in sequence. And since it's the same cells I'm adjusting, I don't have to recode this. I just 
record this once and then I can run it repeatedly. And I've, I've set it to a shortcut so that I can just hit a, hit a button and it'll resolve everything. So, you know, just an example, if I take steam to carbon ratio and I change it to three, you know, you see then the equilibriums are all, equilibria are all thrown off, but I can resolve it, hit my button and it re recalculates all, all, all of them. Okay, so let's take a look at our situation. So this is the result of this calculation. And what you can see, if I remember, this is equilibrium. So there's no kinetics here. I'm just saying this stuff, I feed it in, I let it come to equilibrium. And one of the things you'll notice right away is if I'm at room temperature down here, so this is temperature in, in centigrade, I think. Um, if I'm below 100 C, there is no significant reforming. So even under equilibrium conditions, um, methane and water don't react with each other at low temperature. They, are, they prefer to remain as water and methane at equilibrium. On the other hand, if we heat up to like 900 C, um, you can see the methane concentration drops away to zero. So if you're up at or eight or 900 degrees centigrade, at equilibrium, there won't be any methane remaining. If you have water, it is gonna reform all of it. And the only thing that's gonna come out is CO and hydrogen, plus some water and CO2, which are the oxidation products of that reforming process. Where things get a little sticky is if you look in the intermediate range, exactly where we want to run an SOFC <laughs> between like 500 and 800 C, something in that range. That's the exact range where methane goes through a transition from being a very large component of the fuel to being a very small component of the fuel at equilibrium. And so there's a very rapid change in the methane concentration over this, over this range. And so if you, you can imagine that in the fuel cell, we would expect if we have equilibrium going on in the fuel cell as well, that a lot of reforming happens in the fuel cell. And that is why if you look at most designs for SOFC systems, they have both a pre-reformer and they are also relying on some direct internal reforming within the stack itself. Both things are happening and it impacts the energy balance. So we have to consider it. The other thing that I'm plotting here in gold, this is not a mole fraction. The gold curve is a plot of K over Q for the coking reaction. And what it is showing is that there is no risk of coking at low temperature. There is no risk of coking at high temperature. There is maximal risk of coking right in the middle where we're operating the SOFC. Just to show you and illustrate this point, I have put in a steam to carbon ratio of 2.5. That's a lot of water that we're feeding in. If I lower this to like, I don't know, one. So this is feeding in one water molecule per methane molecule, just as an example. I'm gonna hit command option S and resolve. Okay, that's the revised situation. It's telling us that in this intermediate temperature range, we're gonna go over one for K over Q for coking. That's not enough water. It's different than a flash heating of methane and water up to 900 C. If you do that fast enough, you're not gonna coke because you're gonna quickly move through that territory where coking happens, go into a regime where any carbon that would precipitate would then just be reoxidized. That's not true for our fuel cell, which is operating in this more middle range temperature. If we have surfaces around metal surfaces or stainless steel surfaces in these things, carbon precipitates, it jams up the entryways to the stack and also destroys some catalysts. Um, I'll show you some pictures toward the end of the class, what happens to a nickel anode if you uh, go into this region of operation. Uh, it destroys the cell. So we got to keep this higher. Exactly what we need is a little bit dependent, gets into the kinetics. If I go to a steam to carbon ratio of two, as an example, it looks safe. If I go to a steam to carbon ratio of 1.5, recalculate, that's right on the edge. So you'll see in the literature, a lot of people will throw around the number two. You know, rough rule of thumb, steam to carbon ratios of two or greater. That comes from this. So basically we're saying if we stay at around two or higher, 
that keeps us in pretty safe territory, regardless of what transients or temperatures or excursions we have in our system.